Thanks, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the folks that have joined us today. It's so good to have this turnout, and I'm happy to be your moderator for today's panel. Um, my name is Eugene Meeson, and I'm the Director of Data and Program Management at Meetup. Welcome to our Meetup Live event. Today, we're joined by our special guest, Anne Griffin, who is an expert in AI, blockchain, and inclusivity. She'll be discussing real life examples of what goes wrong when we build technology without considering the potential for harmful outcomes. You'll learn about algorithms which are integrated into the systems we interact with daily. And we'll talk about communities that have been affected by AI applications, as well as what some organizations are doing to increase transparency in the field. Uh, before we hear from Anne, I'll start off with our event guidelines. Uh, keep in mind, this event is being recorded, but don't worry, you will not actually appear in the video recording. Uh, we have also gone ahead and muted your audio, so unfortunately, we cannot hear you. Um, feel free to submit questions in the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen, since we do have allotted time in this event for questions and answers. And there's closed captioning that uh, is available to you if you desire to turn it on. Just click on the live transcript icon at the bottom of your screen and select your preference. As for our agenda, I'll introduce our special guest, move directly into a fireside chat on the topic of artificial intelligence, and then leave the last section for your questions. So today we are joined by Anne Griffin. Anne is a product leader, a startup advisor, and subject matter expert in AI, blockchain, tech ethics, and inclusivity. She has lectured at prestigious universities across North America, such as Columbia University, West Point, the University of Montreal, and Morgan State University. She's spoken at major events such as South by Southwest and created courses for O'Reilly Media. You can also listen to our takes on AI, blockchain, and other technologies on the YouTube original series, Retro Tech with Marquise Brownlee and podcasts such as Blockchain Won't Save the World and Let's Chat Ethics. And I'm excited to have you here. And being from the data and analytics world myself, we all know the term AI, but sometimes it's also a bit nebulous. So I wanted to kick off our conversation on a very basic question. What is AI and where did it originate from? Yes, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm so excited. So artificial intelligence, really that term comes from this idea that this is quote unquote intelligence that is being mimicked or done by machine. That specific definition has, I wanna say changed, but how they specifically word it, they try to word it more of like something that can kind of carry out, I wanna say like rational decision-making in a way that like maybe a human possibly would. So we're starting to see that integrated in a lot more of our technologies today from anything from our search engines to detecting credit card fraud. Um, mm -hmm. And think about all these things where, again, the idea was like, how do we take these things that humans are able to do and have a machine able to handle this themselves? Can you talk a little bit about where it first originated from? Yeah. I mean, the history of the concept of AI actually goes way, way back. We actually have some of our first written accounts of, I think, very, very early concepts in ancient Greece, where they talked about building kind of this metal man that you could program, not in a computer way, they didn't really have the concept of computers back then, but able to kind of control and tell it what to do, right? So that's a really early stage idea of where this came from. Then you had the turn of the century where you had Ada Lovelace and Car um, sorry Charles Babbage, who really you know started laying the foundations with that, some of the first computers. And then you had like the 40s and 50s, where at Dartmouth you had you know the first first place essentially that first conference at Dartmouth that labeled this actually artificial intelligence, and it became its own field of study in computer science. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that timeline taking us all the way back. Um, you had mentioned how we're using it in very common daily examples. Can you can you elaborate on that and give the audience more um, description about that? Yeah, absolutely. And so there are many branches of artificial intelligence. 
um, anything from computer vision, natural language processing, like predictive analytics. There are a lot of ways in which it is really beneficial to us. Um, one example here is we're using live transcription here in this event today. Mm -hmm. Something like natural language processing, which is a branch of AI, is how we're able to do that. Because in the past, right, we would have to have somebody transcribing this really fast. We would have to pay someone to be able to do that. You think really that's what partly why we also have court stenographers here in the United States to have a record of what's going on and not saying live transcription is 100% accurate all the time. There is human intervention still needed for mm -hmm. a lot of it, but you realize how that opens up for accessibility wise, also how it makes it a lot easier for people who couldn't attend the event to kind of skim through and understand what happened here. So there's a lot of things in which, you know, we're using this in our day to day. You don't stop and think of like, oh yeah, the AI live transcription. You're just like, oh great, there's gonna be a transcript of this event. Yes, it's always those things that you're not really thinking about that actually come to life. And when you think about, oh, that is AI, you recognize it's there um, more so around you all the time. Yes, absolutely. Um, how did you become interested in working in this field? Yeah, my interest, well, I'll say to start, I already previously studied engineering. I didn't study computer engineering. I still had to learn how to program, but I studied engineering. So I've always been really interested in technology. But then once I was already out in the workplace, working in tech, working as a product manager, I started hearing a lot of headlines talking about what if AI takes all our jobs? What happens if everything becomes automated? And there were all these very, you know, hyped up news articles and videos about this. And I wanted to learn more about how much of a reality that was. And in learning more about AI, what it is, what it isn't, I also learned a lot about, you know, good uses of AI and reasons why it's really good. I also learned, you know, some of the cons and the things that we need to look out for, like bias and those sort of things. But that really made me really excited because when I first got excited, I got excited because I saw the potential for it to do so much more to be able to help us day to day, one of the first things I ever wrote about AI was this idea of using AI as a chat bot in a waiting room in like a hospital or something or emergency room to really try to add a human element to be able to kind of express, you know, is there a change in your symptoms? Are there other things that you wanna tell? Because oftentimes, especially here in the United States, if you end up in an ER, you know, it's really hard to get to talk to a person, that person is overworked, they're very busy and you're not super confident if everything that you need to relay gets across. And so the first article I ever wrote was specifically talking about how you potentially could use an AI chatbot to try to create this level of empathy in a situation which is kind of stressful for a lot of people. Oh, I just love that because I know whenever I go to the doctor, my blood pressure pretty much spikes. But if I had a chatbot calm me down right before they're taking my blood pressure, I'm yeah. sure that would help. Yeah. Um, and just explaining what your symptoms are and like to a chatbot seems a little bit more easier if you have some sort of like, uh, I don't know, shyness about certain things you're feeling. So I could see how that would be very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And you don't also feel that pressure of this doctor who you know is going to be very busy and that if you forget a thing. So if you're in this time where you're spending all this time in the waiting room, you're able to kind of communicate those things or even communicate your nervousness. You're able to do this in an environment where you're not feeling like you're being rushed through it. And that mm -hmm. information would be able to be relayed to a medical professional. Right. Um, you mentioned how before in the news and in the headlines, people were reading, oh, we may lose our jobs from AI. And there's a lot of automation that's happening. Um, do you actually think some of that is true? And what, where is that impacted um, most? Yeah, I do think it is true. I think where it's undetermined is how many jobs exactly are gonna be lost. Mm -hmm. There are some people who theorize that, you know, that it's gonna be this really big problem in the future. And you're gonna have all these people who don't have skills in which there needs to be a human to do those jobs which is why you see a lot of talk about the concepts of universal basic income. You have also people who believe we're gonna be able to create enough new jobs that are gonna replace those old jobs. Especially when you've looked at previous industrial revolutions, um, like the one we're going through now, you've seen that there are new jobs that have come into existence that didn't used to exist in the past. Mm -hmm. So there are things that no longer are a job 
that I'll say like there are lots of things where, for example, you don't necessarily need a secretary to take notes because you, again, have things like live transcription. There are lots of other things. It's a lot easier to be able to take notes on your computer. So that's something where we still have things like executive assistants, but specifically certain parts of people's jobs are being automated. And the thing that people need to think about in terms of what parts of my job can be automated or can my job be automated, thinking of things that are repetitive tasks that are like a pretty easy decision tree for yes. a machine or a computer to mimic. And one thing I always tell people, like we don't really know what's going to happen for sure in terms of AI replacing jobs. So it's always really important to upskill and kind of pay attention to where are the, where are the new jobs and like, how can I get trained? Cause there are also a lot of training programs to help up, upskill people who are interested in that. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of some of these negative thoughts folks have about AI, um, what are some other possible cons that people associate it to? Yeah, I would say the biggest one and one that I've done a lot of talks um, and research on is around bias mm -hmm. and how that really impacts, especially um, communities of color, but also women, um, also the LGBTQIA community and also people with disabilities. Uh, one of the things that I've talked a lot about is there's a company called Palantir. They do a lot of what they do is connecting a lot of information that is readily available on the internet from anything from social networks to just like information that might be about like who your relatives are that are out there um, mm -hmm. to really kind of paint a picture about like who you are, um, where do you go? Because there's a lot of location data associated with a lot of the apps on your phone and really kind of understanding like this is this person's neighborhood. These are this person's closest friends. There's actually been things where Palantir has been able to predict that people were actually having an affair on someone else. That wasn't the reason why they were using it, but that's how actually like invasive a tool like this is used. And it's actually used quite a bit by um, police departments across the country. And while certain police departments have denied that it's been used in convictions, those same police departments have admitted that they've used it to try to identify gang members as well as things like racketeering. Um, so this is a common tool, but it's something that you're never really gonna hear a lot about in the news in terms of how they're actually determining that these people know each other, where certain people were at a certain time. And it comes into this gray area here in the United States of you know, what is constitutionally protected in a more digital realm versus if they had to follow someone around or maybe get warrants to go into certain places to really see like who is meeting with who, who knows what, um, those sort of things. And there've been people who, um, you know, have maintained their innocence and said, I'm not a gang member who have actually been added to police gang um, member data, um, databases mm -hmm. just because of their connections that were identified via Palantir. Wow. I, I have a bunch of questions I want to come back to on that, on like the ethics of AI, um, the security of AI. But um, before we get there, I wanted to just talk a little bit about um, what are some of those like trending topics in AI today? Like what are the biggest trending items within AI um, that are right now spoken about in the media? Yeah. I mean, I do think, even though I said Palantir isn't explicitly brought up, I do think one of the biggest ones, which is similar to Palantir, but different, is really facial recognition. This is being talked about a lot because there are more and more companies that are trying to use this as a way of like a biometric tool to gain access. So this is something where uh, before the pandemic, when everyone was wearing, well, not everyone's wearing masks on, masks on planes anymore, but before masks on planes was more normalized, there was this idea of we're gonna use facial recognition to um, check you before you board an international flight. And it's gonna check against your passport photo. And that was considered normal. Um, there are things where actually here in New York, there were certain landlords that were trying to use facial recognition to, you know, as basically your access to and from the building. However, that becomes a thing of, you can now actually, you know, say this is exactly when this person was leaving mm -hmm. to and from the building with ease, which is a little different than just having a camera that's there if you can access and you need it later. Um, and so this is becoming a hot topic just because facial recognition is not as effective when it comes to women and especially people of color. And especially if you look at, you know, for example, it's like basically black women, because the darker you are, the less likely facial recognition is to work um, in terms of per correctly identifying someone. And this was a number of years ago. So they've 
updated it since, but it's still not perfect. You know, um, Amazon's own facial recognition system incorrectly identified several members of Congress. And most of those members of Congress were women or people of color. And even um, this is back when John Lewis was alive. It also misidentified John Lewis as well. Mm. And you think this is someone where there's so many photos on the internet of this person. How can somebody's facial recognition system incorrectly identify somebody who is photographed as frequently as John Lewis? And so that's a topic that's coming up a lot um, you know, in AI and especially questions around um, privacy and security and what is your data allowed to be used in this? And like, do you have a say in how your data is, is used by these companies who basically train their algorithms off of the data that they get from you? Right. Okay. Going into AI bias for the audience, can you explain what AI bias is? Yeah. So th th there's different ways in which AI can be biased. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it comes from, you know, the way you think about it, even human bias. And that's really where AI bias comes from. It's like, this is some sort of form of, you know, so some form of discrimination and or mm -hmm. harm that is happening to a person or group of people based on like race, um, ethnicity, um, you know, gender. There's also like, uh, it can also be, you know, like I said, anything from how you, not just like gender in terms of, okay, man or woman, or like, hey, we're discriminating against women, but also things where it's like, for example, if you build a system that doesn't recognize people who use different pronouns, or you know, you're gonna identify someone who's non-binary as a man or woman, there's also things where you can discriminate against a number of people, or you can build an AI system that isn't actually helpful to people with disabilities. So anything that is like hurting you know, that group of people. So again, when you look at also, you know, how surveillance is often used, it's often used on black and brown people in the United mm -hmm. States. So there's a lot of things where, especially when you start talking about surveillance that now intersects with facial recognition, and you think about all the people who are potentially arrested, who are completely innocent because there was a false, you know, like a false positive in that facial recognition saying, oh, this person is indeed this person. And you should, and they did, and we, they, they are a suspect for this crime. It can also be things like Sophia Noble. She has a great book called Algor Algorithms of Oppression, where she also talks about, like, for example, if you try to Google professional hair, something you're not going to see come up is like black women's hair that is, you know, in different natural hairstyles. Or one of the things that she actually has on the cover of her book is she, this is years ago, Google actually fixed it. If you type this in, it won't return anything. Um, the predictive results that when you start typing into Google, when you type in why are black women so back in the day, it actually suggested things like mad, angry, you know, a lot of very negative things. And these are all things where you have to think about just because this is what racist people in some part of the country type in, does mm -hmm. that necessarily mean that this is the system should just automatically build that in and learn and say, great, we're going to suggest these results to people next time. Right, right. So how do we correct some of that? How, how does the police force or how does Google, like how do they go about uh, retraining AI so it's not as biased? Yeah, so there's, there's a number of ways. Some of it is really being very thoughtful up front and identifying biases in your data set because ultimately that's what you're learning from. And if you have to kind of modify that data set so you can make it more diverse, especially because when we start talking about certain data sets, excluding certain groups, you realize like, yeah, it's really bad because it's not training on any of those mm -hmm. people. So then that's one of them. The other thing is making sure that these teams are diverse and because you're having teams that are making decisions about software that's, you know, impacts almost everybody in the world, right? you're making software that touches almost, you know, every human in the world in some cases or impacts people when they're at their most vulnerable. And you really want to make sure that people who have different voices are in the room. And also if you can't, if no one on your team has those voices, like for example, if you're working at Google, there's probably no one work, working at Google on those type of teams that is low income. Like how do you talk mm -hmm. to the, bring those people in to also hear how this might impact them depending on what do you, specifically building, right? So those are those are some of the ways in which like you need to think about it. There's some technologies where people like facial recognition where people are pushing for 
like a complete ban in the United States because they don't feel like there's any safe way to do that. Mm -hmm. But there's other algorithms in which people are like, these types of things, we just want to make sure you have diverse teams building it. You're really analyzing this data set and then even maybe bringing in firms to kind of analyze these things. And there's also the side of regulation, which I don't think there's really been any super successful regulation as of yet. There's been some attempts, but they've been pretty toothless. Got it. So um, in terms of like ethics that are applied to AI, would you say the responsibility of that AI just lands back on the corporations building it out? I would say it belongs to everyone, but also definitely corporations. Like they have, you know, they, especially some of these where they impact so much of our lives and so many people globally, you know, they have a responsibility to make sure Mm -hmm. that what they're building is ethical, that it's fair and as unbiased as humanly possible and continue to learn and continue to improve on those fronts. I also believe it's really important for the average person to learn about these topics so that they can understand, you know, how the technology in their life is leveraging these technologies and understand where they're like, I actually feel very uncomfortable about this. And you know, one person writing to a big corporation isn't going to change anything, or just one person writing to the government isn't going to change everything. But really being able to kind of the more people we have that understand this, and kind of say like, this makes me uncomfortable, I don't like this, that are going to put pressure on companies, put pressure on our government, that's, that's going to be, you know, those things are very helpful. And then I also think part of it is our government, when you realize, especially how, um, you know, there are a lot of there are a lot of great use cases of AI. Like I love that my credit card company uses AI to detect fraud. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about like the old days, um, you know, in the nineties before, like we had this way of automatic automatically detecting that sort of thing. And now it's like, this is completely needed with living in this age of the internet, but you also have other things where, you know, you're like, yeah, I wouldn't want this to happen to me. Like Virginia Eubanks talks about in automating inequality, about how her partner um, had her, had their insurance actually flagged as um, like a fraud claim because her partner was like very violently mugged like the day their insurance started and the insurance company th- thought, oh, this looks like fraud, but there was really no way for the people on the phone to like understand, well, why did this get flagged as fraud? And it resulted in her and her partner incurring like lots of debt and putting a lot of the medical bills on credit cards until they could fight the credit card companies, you know, like or not the credit cards, the insurance company to really be able to say, okay, this was not fraud. Clearly this person got mugged, but it was a really long time for them to do that. And partly she had the idea that it might be flagged as fraud because this is actually a field that she works in. So right. you really think about the people who don't really know about this type of thing and they're facing this system without that kind of empowerment or that knowledge. Mm -hmm. You were talking a lot about facial recognition um, in a sense of like where data is everywhere. And we we have to think about privacy. Um, How can we be more private with our data um, when you know, you can take pictures of anyone anywhere and and try to locate where they are, et cetera. Yeah, I think there's a couple things is some of it is there are browsers. I think Brave Browser is, you know, known for, you know, privacy. There's also things where, you know, checking, checking some of your privacy settings on your apps, on your phone. There's, to be honest, it is very limiting in what you actually can do to protect your, your privacy. I remember like NPR a number of years ago did something where they actually tried to remove all the data they could find on the internet um, of them off. Like they were like, had certain people where this was part of their project where they like remove everything off the internet about yourself. Mm -hmm. And they spent like months trying to do this and were exhausted. And they still were like, yeah, there's still stuff out there where I just couldn't figure out how to remove it. And so those are all things that you need to think about. Like you want to be careful with your data, but also just, you know, be aware of when you do sign terms of use, how you're giving data. Like a lot of people every now and then you see those things go around Facebook where they're like, I don't give Facebook the right to use yes. this, that, the third, that doesn't mean anything. And also Facebook is also using, you know, computer vision to like analyze photos and be like, Oh, this person posts a lot of this. So we should show a lot of similar things in their feed. Oh, it looks like this person is with, you know, their friend, Emily, 
And so, you know, we recommend that this person tag Emily. There's a lot of things like that where they have your data and, you know, there's not a lot of say once they have it and what you can do with it. And a lot of, especially since we're in an ad based world right now, Mm -hmm. a lot of that can, you know, be bought and sold without a lot of consent. You're seeing, um, this is kind of oldish now, but the European Union and GDPR, um, which is basically a law around data privacy and protection, which, you know, has made some strides, right? Where it gives people, at least in Europe, or if you're a European citizen, more protections in terms of you can say, hey, I have the right to be forgotten, delete all my information from your system, or, you know, I don't want to, you know, I don't consent to this. There's a lot of kind of, when you see certain websites, there's a million cookie things that pop up that kind of say, hey, is it okay if we set cookies? Um, there's, there's those things, but it's still pretty um, challenging in terms of privacy. There's no um, silver bullet in terms of your own privacy. When you're talking about those folks at the NPR and trying to delete their data, I could imagine it would be months, if not years, yeah. um, because folks have such a strong social print. Um, yes. And there's so many sites we visit and social media outlets we go to. Um, I feel like we've kind of been on sort of like the negative side of AI, but yeah. there are some great benefits to AI. I mean, the facial recognition from my Google Photos is amazing because it basically shows me kids, my own kids, when they were like three years and have changed up until now to seven years. So there's still a lot of positives. I'd, I'd love to hear some of your favorite positives about AI. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some of the things that I love are the things that are being done to protect wildlife. Um, you know, there's AI that's actually being used in different places to try to catch poachers. So basically like AI that's using night vision to try to recognize things where it's like, hey, these are usually the type of vehicles that are used by poachers. These people are moving around at a time of night where there really shouldn't be humans hanging out at the, in this specific area that is able to kind of trigger a notice so that the people, the humans that are supposed to help um, protect the wildlife to be able to kind of say, hey, there's poachers in the area. You might want to go out there, um, you know, prevent them from like, you know, killing these elephants um, or these gorillas, depending on what region it's being used in. There's also, they're using um, satellite imagery to prevent over um, like fish poaching over fishing. And the way they do that is they're using that imagery to kind of see like, what is the pattern that this boat is going in? Because people who are usually, um, you know, fishing without permission in a certain area, is usually their boat goes in a different, um, you know, they usually kind of like zigzag and do other things just because it makes it harder for them to get picked up um, mm -hmm. on like radar and other things. And so like, those are things, and they're also able, if the satellite image gets a good, you know, look at the vessel, they can also kind of tell, is this a registered vessel to be fishing? And so that way also when that, eventually that boat has to come back to port, and we're talking about like pretty large situations. We're not talking about these, like, like somebody going out in one tiny little boat. Mm -hmm. They're able to kind of say like, hey, you know, this, this boat was kind of flagged and really kind of be able to tell, hey, this, this was not supposed to happen. You need to return all of this fish. This is not, um, you know, this is not allowed and make it really hard for those people who shouldn't be doing those things to do that. Um, and then one of the things also we're being in a pandemic, something like the flu where we've had it much longer They've been using AI for a while to actually track the flu and predict like, when are we going to, um, you know, reach the peak of the flu season every year? How many people do we predict are going to be infected? And again, it's because they have a pretty large data set to learn from, from different strains of the past. Um, so there was, those are all things where, you know, we're able to track those type of, um, you know, things, especially, you know, how that helps in our public health as well. And also um, I have one more example, uh, but, I no, love I'd love to hear it. Used. Yeah, yeah. I love how it's also being used to de detect things like breast cancer, other cancers, and um, heart disease. Um, when people actually use AI to, you know, again, using computer vision, they'll look at these scans. Um, in combination of using the computer with a doctor, it actually increases the accuracy of a diagnosis, which also prevents like uh, false positives or false negatives. So, and for those of you who've ever had a loved one who had cancer, um, my mom is still alive, but my mom got had breast cancer when I was like five years old. Um, you know, you know that the earlier the diagnosis is, the more likely it is you're going to have a positive income and your loved one's going to live. And so the idea of people being able to use it in those situations is like, you know, like a miracle to me. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm going to pivot our conversation to actually talking about robots and yeah. like how folks think of AI as robots uh, primarily. Um, and I know there's been so many movies. <laughs> Yeah. Um, there's been so many shows like Westworld. Um, like, do we think there, um, how do we define, first of all, like the treatment of AI? When you say define the treatment of AI, do you mean like how they choose to depict it? How, how humans um, treat AIs, like is, how, how should we define that? You mean in terms of, sorry, I just want to make sure I'm understanding, like in terms of acceptable behavior towards yes, AI? Or acceptable like, okay, okay. behavior, yes. Yeah, I mean, this is a great question because you can go on YouTube now and see all sorts of videos of people's kids giving Alexa a lot of sass. And you realize <laughs> like if, if they said that to a real human, you'd be like, oh my gosh, I am raising a monster. And you're like, is that okay to say to Alexa? And I think that's a really it's an area where people are starting to ask it, but I'm seeing more people ask it in the research realm and people who are parents, I believe, but people aren't really, you know, don't really, I think, think about it as like, you know, if you're an adult alone in the room and you like swear at Alexa, you're like, oh, that's fine. But like, you know, let's say you did have a bot, right? And mm -hmm. let's say, you know, like if you got really angry, let's say you had Rosie from the Jetsons as like, instead of a Roomba, you had Rosie from the Jetsons, who, for those of you who don't know, Rosie from the Jetsons was basically like a maid bot who like looks like a humanoid type bot um, and is responsible for cleaning um, this house on this like futuristic cartoon TV show. And let's say someone gets really angry and is like, I'm going to punch Rosie in the face. Right. And I think there's this question of, you know, when people think about, okay, if you hurt, you know, something that would be considered a house pet, they like flag you as like, this person might have problems. Like mm. we should really look into that, get them help or, you know, claim like, at least like from the stance of, Hey, they damaged someone's property. But like, what happens if it's like, this is your, you know, this is your own robot. It can't actually, at least where we are now, like it can't actually feel things. And I think that's a really big open question that people are, are asking themselves. I personally feel it's like, it's a tr tricky line though. I would be very hesitant to be in a room who like beat the crap out of like Rosie, the robot, mm -hmm. you know, I'd be like, I really think there's something wrong here. And maybe we should at least, <laughs> they should at least be eligible to get help. If we're going to, if we're not going to say, Hey, this person did terrible things. I'm scared that they would do this to another human. Right. And so it is, it is a very controversial topic. Another um, sort of controversial one that I recently was back in 2016 is um, like Elon Musk and the pigs and trying to make cyborgs and like there's a lot of good that can come out of it. Um, but there's also a lot of um, things that people fear and I was just wondering like your take on that. I mean, there's there's a few things, especially when, you know, my, my question is like when you start integrating certain types of technologies into, into like living beings that really can't consent. You could technically say like, okay, well then does that mean like we can't have a meat industry, that sort of thing. But when you think about quality of life with animals and you think about, is this something where this animal potentially could suffer because there's things that you're integrating into them that like this species just like wasn't meant to have, like they're not a human. They can't really talk to us about like, are they in a lot of pain? Like what's, what's going on here? I think there's a lot of questions around here. There's, there are communities that actually of humans who willingly actually put this into their own bodies, mm -hmm. um, which I think is really interesting and want to kind of alter themselves in you know, this kind of more cyborg ish type of way. And I really think a lot of that needs to come down to um, living things that can consent into them. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think, I think that's like the real, the real thing. And then also thinking about when we start thinking about putting these into humans, again, it becomes a data issue and then also a privacy issue. When you also think about Neuralink and they want to put, attach that to people's brains, you know, you wonder, okay, what happens if they can actually send signals to your brain that you wouldn't otherwise want right. there? You know, it's one thing for, you know, thoughts to be in your mind that you don't want there, but you're at least like, okay, cool. Your brain is just doing normal brain things. But it's another thing when you start realizing 
okay, like there are a lot of things that could go wrong here from an ethical standpoint that could really impact someone's quality of life and their free will. Thank you so much, Anne, for that. Um, I feel like we've gone through all the questions we had planned today, um, but I wanted to ask you, like, is there something more broad, general that you want, like as a message to our audience that you want to share? I would say, do your best to, you know, learn more about AI. Um, don't be intimidated. There's a lot of great resources out there for people. If you're just starting to learn about it, learning a little bit about it, you don't necessarily have to be the person that's like, great, I'm going to take all these computer science classes. If you want to do that, that's great. But there's a lot you can learn to better empower yourself, understand how it's being used in day-to-day -day te technology and like kind of you know, go to meetups, um, find people that you feel safe talking to, because I think people think, oh, if I'm going to learn about this high tech thing, I have to have a massive brain, be a super genius, and I have to go back to school. You don't necessarily have to do that. And I would say the other big thing is um, be on the lookout for opportunities to upskill and just learn about things, because there's things, even, for example, in manufacturing, our our manufacturing is also becoming more high tech and using AI to be more efficient. And there are certain types of manufacturing jobs where now you have to be able to work alongside with these like robots or machines or AI. And that does take some extra training. And it's really interesting where there have been cases of people losing their jobs because a lot of the factory became automated and another you know, manufacturer will come to town and say, we're trying to hire for these jobs, but we need people to be willing to upskill like we'll offer the classes and everything to do the more high tech version of the same job. And sometimes people are like, oh, I don't really want to do that. I just like my old job. Right. Mm. But I would say in terms of how quickly technology is evolving, staying on top of upskilling. Um, and if people offer you upskilling for free, uh, take the opportunity. Otherwise there's lots of great opportunities, like even just tapping into certain things in Coursera or Udemy, like, um, you know, learning learning those things even at a high level is going to set you up better for the future thank you Anne. um if you had any specific courses from udemy or other ones that you wanted to share with the group um maybe we could share those links with the audience yeah um like so, so i can share those do you want me to share them now or do you want me to send them after sorry oh you could share them now yeah, um, I'll just say a couple of things that I really love. Um, I have some of my, the books here that I think are really also a great starting point if you're interested in learning more about bias is um, Safiya Noble's Algorithms of Oppression. Um, it is like probably one of the, my favorite, favorite books in the space. Um, as mentioned, Virginia Eubanks, Automating Inequality, also a really great book about, especially like our systems from insurance to our social, um, you know, social benefits, like specifically how, how, we're using AI in those places and how it's actually impacting our vulnerable communities. Also highly recommend, um, uh, like Kathy, I can't remember her last name, um, but it's Weapons of Math Destruction, great book. Um, or if you wanna talk to me, you can reach out to me at um, antigriffin.com. Thank you, Anne. Yeah. Um, so I think we're gonna actually turn this over to Q&A. We got a bunch of questions. Um, so I will start reading off some of those. Awesome, that sounds um, great. Stanley Lee asked, how educated do you think everyone should become regarding AI? I think that people should become, I think there's, I don't think anyone, I don't think everyone needs to go out tomorrow and take a data science class. I don't think everyone needs to get a degree. I think people should be educated enough to be able to understand basically that, that be able to identify the AI being used in the tools we're using. So mm -hmm. if you see something like transcription, be able to say, okay, that's natural language processing, or be able to, even if you don't use the exact wording and say like, okay, cool. I know that this is AI and it's like processing language. Um, being able to kind of say, okay, I understand that using, for example, like if so, anyone here has used Canva, it's a design tool, removing the background in a photo um, in Canva, that's leveraging AI or understanding even things like when I mentioned earlier, like, you know, credit card fraud detection, you know, understanding how your bank or credit card company is handling that is AI. And because I think when you understand how integrated AI is, 
there's pl- things where you're going to be like, I don't really care. That's fine. And there's going to be things where you're going to be able to say, I don't feel comfortable about this. I'm going to figure out what I need to do about that. Um, Jordan Williams asks, do you anticipate a realistic way for AI to be used for the long-term betterment of mankind instead of simply whatever makes the most money for corporations? I do think that is really complicated because AI is, it's not a cheap (laughs) um, thing to build. Um, A lot of this is, a lot of the AI for good things are being funded by grants or um, being supported by universities. I think that there needs to be a lot more in terms of how we maintain it. And it might be regulation makes it so that like, hey, you know, part of money from certain companies goes towards, you know, building some sort of trust that's gonna support these type of initiatives in the future. Like for example, even just something, this is not, that's not how it's done, but you know, you think about certain things like the National Science Foundation, where you have foundations that are set up to be able to say like, hey, we're going to support research. We're going to support science. There needs to be something where it's like, where is this funding going to come from? Because if it's always just like, you know, oh, Deloitte or Microsoft just felt like giving a ton of money this year, right? Next year might be different. So we need to have institutions that are with us for the long term to be able to make sure that these things get funded. Because unfortunately, you know, that's right now it is really based on like how can you make money off of this AI and so a lot of this is really focused on like government stuff is focused on corporations like how do you automate things so that it's like faster more efficient yeah um Maxine um asks a great question what's the margin of error and accuracy percentage of AI versus human error it's going to depend on specifically what type of AI you're talking about and also like whose algorithm it is. Like, even if you're talking about facial recognition specifically, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, um, but even like facial recognition, if you look at Microsoft's facial recognition versus Amazon's facial recognition versus Google's facial recognition, they actually all have slightly different levels of accuracy. Mm -hmm. And so those are all things where um, you can actually Google like Amazon uh, facial recognition accuracy And there'll be lots of articles out there about that. But those are all things where it's usually very specific to like who made it and like what specific um, part of AI you're talking about. And every algorithm, basically like every algorithm you create is going to have its own level of accuracy. Mm -hmm. Um, Can an anonymous person wrote in, can AI evolve itself? For example, the future will have inclusive terms that don't exist yet. If unmoderated, can AI teach itself? It, again, it's going to depend on the algorithm because a lot of, I'll say, kind of self-teaching algorithms are out there. They're much more challenging to create. And then, again, it is still very tricky. Um, you know, so, and the other problem is, is like sometimes when they try to create things that are going to teach itself, it's not, sometimes it's not even really teaching itself. It's really learning from everyone. Like you can look at, I don't know if anyone remembers that Twitter bot called Tay that Microsoft released. And because people just started tweeting obscenities at this bot Tay, it started saying some like really disgusting, um, sexist and racist things. So, you know, there, there's a lot of things where you have to really be able to create something that's learning, but then you'd also have to have some form of rules around within it to be able to say, this is a, a behavior we want to um, encourage you to learn versus something that we want to discourage you from, from doing, even if you learn it. So it is, it's really, it's really interesting. Um, so there, it is possible to have something that continues to self-learn. Those are not as common. Usually it's going to be like a human adjusting for that and like having to put in like retraining algorithm or building a new algorithm. That's just more inclusive. Um, how's the future and expectations of AI looking for the next two, five, 10 years horizon? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a really big question. I mean, I really see it as like 10 years. We already see it integrated into a lot. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see it integrated even more. I think what's going to be really interesting is, 
And I know everyone's tired of hearing about it, like Web3 and blockchain, just because I think that if we leverage AI, there's possibly ways that they could use that um, in combination with cryptography and everything else to actually make some of those systems more efficient. And there's a lot of use cases for the intersection of blockchain and AI. And I really think that once blockchain is in a better place for mass adoption, you're going to see that intersection a lot more in like a Web3 type world. In the short term, I think we're going to continue to see a lot of what we have now where it's like people using it, um, you know, for example, like TikTok, they also use, um, you know, natural language processing to do like transcriptions over videos that made it like really common. So you're going to see basically some of these technologies proliferating because they're also like popularized by like popular apps as well. So that's really kind of where I see it more on like the consumer side and on the business side. Again, I really think it's like companies. I really feel like spent the last decade finally getting their data in a place where they can start to do AI. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of these companies, other than, other than the Googles, the Amazons and those kind of companies, I think a lot of the companies are a lot more behind than people really realize. And I think we're now just getting to a place where you're going to now see corporations leveraging a lot more of it because their data for their company just wasn't in a place in the last decade. And it takes a very long time to, you know, get set up in the right way. If you already have all this historic, historical data, that's not set up, um, you know, to be like processed or leveraged right. by an algorithm. Talking about Amazon and Google, we have a question from Ivan. Are AI systems from companies like Amazon and Google interacting with each other or just by themselves? Do you happen to know? Well, I will say, so if, for example, if Amazon has a specific algorithm, they probably don't want, like, at least like, it, I, I don't think, it depends on what we're, we're applying it to, but I generally, I think it'd be like, okay, great. Like, we're not going to be building with Google because that's our competitor and we want people to use our software that has this algorithm. Um, you know, they could decide to let them play nice, but that's about the same as like, how nice, if, if someone has an Android and someone has an iPhone, how nice do Google and Apple allow those to play together, mm -hmm. right? And they make so much money off these enterprise deals. Like they maybe could, but like, that's not really uh, a normal thing that like can Google and Amazon would wanna like team up on. They might team up on like going to Capitol Hill and encouraging, you know, less regulation, um, but they're not going to like team up and be like, oh, let's build like a super algorithm together because they really want these proprietary algorithms so that they can benefit themselves. Right. Um, what are the differences between AI and machine learning? Yeah. I mean, machine learning is just like one part of AI. And so again, machine learning is in the name where it's like, you're really, it's like a big part of the AI where you are taking in data you, and also kind of like outputting it, especially when you think about predictive analytics, that's like a really big application of machine learning, but AI is generally the umbrella. Um, machine learning is just like kind of one of like the many fields under AI. Mm -hmm. We have a couple questions about regulations again. Um, who's responsible for regulations and limitations of AI and the violation of personal privacy rights? I mean, so again, it's going to be dependent on what country you're in. So if you're based in the United States, then, I mean, that's definitely like our, our government, like again, the European Union passed like GDPR law, you know, there's definitely Congress has, you know, their own committees. And so a committee might come up with something like that, but like Congress would ultimately have to pass that sort of thing. Um, just like any other type of law. There's also state level laws. Um, you know, California recently passed mm -hmm. recently ish pass like a privacy law. Um, but I think it also depends on, do you believe this should be a state issue, which also becomes very messy very quickly because you have all these different laws at the state level in terms of data privacy, or do you think this should be a federal level and companies should figure this out like, you know, country to country based on like a countrywide level of, of um, regulation around data? Um. What ways can people help create or maintain regulations on AI? Is it petitions, local politicians? Yeah, I would say both of those things, petitions, local politicians, um, meeting with groups that are, you know, specifically talking about these things. Um, there's like, you know, for example, there's things like data for black lives where like they get very involved in these issues. They create their own petitions. Um, they talk to local and like uh, federal lawmakers. 
there's, so there's a lot of different types of groups that you can find that are specifically trying to, you know, pass regulations around some of the issues that we see in AI and um, similar fields. Um, what are your thoughts on using AI in the hiring, HR hiring process? Uh, there appears to be some bias occurring there and many qualified people, women and older workers aren't even making it to a human for an interview. Yeah, I would say within HR, I don't, I personally, from what I've read and seen, I, I think there's, it's very problematic using AI in that specific way in HR. I understand it's really hard to go through a thousand resumes, but where we've seen, we've seen things where it's like repeatedly, the AI is really just using the data that these companies have been, their previous hiring patterns, Yes. which you know, you realize even just as recently as like, you know, civil rights was only passed in like the 1960s. And even then it didn't mean like, oh, wow, by the 80s, you had all these, you know, women and people of color in, in these like big corporations, like leading them. Right. So when you look at how people have used AI in hiring, it does introduce a lot of bias. And it's not that I think, oh, there's never a point where this will get in a better place. But I think oftentimes they fit in the weird loophole where they somehow have managed to elude like the regulations around like, Hey, you can't discriminate against these groups. Um, because I think of just, I think it's more so because they're like, well, it was the AI, it wasn't us, but also mm-hmm. it's like very, very hard and very expensive to be able to sue. Like actually yep. Kathy O'Neill also talks about this in her book. Um, someone that she met, like they were, they were actually um, denied repeatedly from getting a job at Kroger And it turns out all the questions that were asked on the Kroger application, um, how the algorithm weighted the responses was pretty much in like in line with like how you would ask questions around like telling if somebody had a very specific um, like mental disability. And the only reason why this person ended up suing and winning was because their dad was a lawyer because their dad asked them like, wait, you got turned down again from this job. What happened? And they oh, were for like, folks that don't know Kroger, Kroger is a oh, supermarket, right? Yeah, it's a supermarket. So this is, this is not even like a high corporate job, but cor- basically um, they had to answer all these questions, um, you know, as part of the hiring process um, through one of these like computer systems. And it kept basically denying them when it give them an interview. And it turned out like a lot of the questions and also how they weighted the answers for it Um basically we're like a really good way to tell someone I've had a disability. And the only reason why this came up is because that person's dad was like, well, what types of questions did it ask you? And when he told his dad, these are the questions they asked me, he was like, I'm a lawyer and I know that's discrimination. So I'm going to see you, but like everybody else, the average person, you're like, they use AI, but if, you know, if your resume gets passed over, you don't really know for, you can't really prove that, okay, it was the AI. Here was the mm-hmm. reason why it would have to be some sort of like class action lawsuit. And how would you find all those other people So it's really just becomes this thing of they're able to kind of use it because um, or just like those companies that are building it the way they're building it. It's easier for them to kind of avoid being further regulated because it is so hard for people to be able to actually say, like, I'm going to I can afford to fight you as an individual or I can find other people that I know have been discriminated against based on an algorithm that I actually don't even know if you use or not. Mm -hmm. Uh, The next question. um actually comes from a meetup employee. Um, At meetup, some of our groups are based partially on aspects of identity. For example, like age and gender. Um, At that same time, we allow members to tell us their age and gender so we can help uh, suggest and recommend. Um, For example, there's a great New York based group called Aging with Attitude. Um, when we announce its presence to our members, we don't actually let our me- models train on the identity related information. We just filter that afterwards. Is there an ethical way to guess someone's identity and use that guess to filter? I would say, I would say it's a really tricky question. And I will say, I don't have a good answer for that. I would say the way you're trying to do it is like, you're, you're trying to do it the best way you can and in a very like ethical way. Um, and there's different arguments for that where it's like, especially if you're like identity is such a big part of it, be able to say like, yeah, I do want to find people who are, you know, who are similar to me 
and be able to kind of say, I want to do that. But that also becomes a thing of, it's really easy for algorithms to also start saying like, I'm not going to show this to you because everybody, it seems like this event skews really young, which is really good, I guess, if you're doing an ad-based model. But if you're also saying like, these are things where people are learning, they're really interested in, in different things. They're not only going to want to see things that are for people like in this specific age range, um, then it becomes like a bit of a bit of an issue. So I don't, I don't really, unfortunately, I don't have a great answer to that. I'm not saying, I would say like, I don't necessarily think like every time you use identity, it's necessarily bad. It's just more so like how, how companies choose to do it. And also companies, you know, also knowing repercussions of doing it wrong. But I think meetup is doing like a really good job being like very conscious of it. Okay, um, one last question to wrap up Q&A, um, also from a meetup person, Billy Chung. Uh, the question is, can humans learn from AI? I think the best way humans can learn from AI is, I think AI is really kind of a mirror that we hold up to ourselves. Maybe even, mm. maybe not even just like individualistically, but also um, as a society or as certain companies, because when we really look at how, where AI is, is excelling and actually how it is being helpful, and then also look at where it is harmful and hurting people, I think, you know, especially because we train AI on real data from real humans, and that's why it's beneficial to us. I think it really shows us some of the best things that we can do and like where we can be more helpful in our lives and mm. where also we're like, yeah, like this is really harmful. Like we need to be more aware of this. If this is learning, you know, to exclude women, like resumes of women or, Hey, it's misidentifying these specific groups. We have to kind of really look at of like, people can't really say, Oh, I'm really shocked that there was like sexism found in, in this, this organization. Or I'm really shocked that there was like a problem with racism. It's really kind of forces us to see us for mm -hmm. us. Thank you so much, Anne. That um, concludes all the questions that we had time for in the Q&A section. I really want to thank all of those that joined us today. I thank you, Anne, for your insightful knowledge and your expertise. Um, and I know uh, you had, we had shared some links for people, um, specifically in the chat of the books that you had mentioned and your website. Uh, please make sure folks can grab those. Um, we're just going to finalize with two slides. Um, just know we offer organizers 30% off on their first subscription with Meetup. We'd love for you to build your community and find others who share your interests. So follow that link for the discount. And also it's been a year since the podcast Keep Connected with our Meetup CEO launched. Uh, please take a moment to scan that QR code and give it a listen. There's great interviews and content with established organizers brought to you by David Siegel. Um, as a reminder, you can view a recap of this event in a few days on our Community Matters blog at meetup.com forward slash blog. Thanks again so much for joining us and stay safe till the next time.